Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In today's video, we will be previewing game week four. This will include a discussion of who is the best Leeds midfielder to pick, Rodrigo, Harrison or Aronson, a discussion of the upcoming fixture congestion and whether the Man City players such as Haaland will be rotated. And we'll also discuss when the best time to wildcard is amongst some other things as well. If you are enjoying the content here on this channel, please do remember to like, comment and subscribe. Without further ado, let's jump into today's video. So guys, before we jump into the video, I wanted to quickly talk about Fanslide. Fanslide is the first in-play fantasy football game. So it's a really super cool, super fun in-play fantasy football game. As you can see here, at the start of the game, you pick three players and they will get you single points, double points and triple points. But interestingly, you can only own each of the players for up to 20 minutes and that does reduce as the game continues, which means you have to try and select when you think these players will do well throughout the game. It's not only that though, because you can slide in and out and you get three free slides per half and you can slide them in and out and decide when you want to own certain players so say after 15 minutes you see like Harry Kane is getting some really good positions he's getting a couple of shots on target and you think he might score soon you can slide out one of your other players and bring in Harry Kane slide him in and if you slide him in before he gets that goal you could get triple points for Harry Kane. So it really rewards people that understand football, understand sequences of play and enjoy making these sort of changes and predictions throughout the game. So if you are prone to doing like an in-play bet and you want something which can be free to play, there are paid for versions on this app, but you can be free to play. Play in play fantasy football. It's actually a lot of fun. That's what I've been doing. I've been playing all of the free competitions and they actually have some prizes as well. So you can play for free and potentially earn some money here. So the other thing I like, as you can see here, is there's points for absolutely everything. So it's not just points for sort of goals, assists and clean sheets as with FPL. There's shots off target, key pass, switch of play. And there's also a lot of negative points as well. So if you've got someone in a triple spot and they get a red card, that's obviously a disaster. But having someone in a triple spot that gets like a shot on target, wins a corner, scores a goal, gets an assist, etc., you can have monster points. You can actually play this with friends. So as you can see here, I've asked you to download using the link in the description. Use the link in the description because that will automatically, when you download the app, actually enter you into my sort of mini league or my group. And when you play with friends, these games are always massively more fun. So I've been playing with my friends and you message throughout the game. So while you're playing it gives you something to think about it gives you something to do and with fpl we sort of just lock our teams in at the start of the week once the deadline's done there's nothing we can do with fan slide it's game by game and you can make changes throughout the game as well. And that's why I have so much fun with it. So I genuinely have been playing this game. I have been enjoying it. You can see my average score. When you join my league, you can see I've been playing the game. So this is something that I'm really enjoying and some, an app that I will continue to play as well. Just finally, before I finish, if you're unsure exactly how the game works, there is an academy section on the app. So once you've downloaded it and joined my league, there's an academy section. So you can find out exactly how the swiping in and out works because you only get three free slides per half and there are some rules to it. So make sure you read the academy rules before you play. And then, like I said, in the step three section, on that list there play the Saints versus Manchester United game with me this weekend we'll talk about it more in the deadline stream but I will be playing the Southampton versus Man United game try and see if you can beat me in my league and if you can win the entire thing you could get some really cool cash prizes so definitely try fans slide out like I said link in the description down below so let's start the game week preview with a question and discussion point, which I think will not only be applicable this week, but potentially going into game week five as well. So I'm sure we will readdress it next week. And that is essentially, there are a lot of games coming up in quick succession. And we are getting to a point this season now, as we always do, when there's going to be a lot of midweek games. So we're getting to a point now because game week five is a midweek game where game week four, five and six for a lot of teams in the space of sort of eight or nine days. And then from game week five onwards, there are midweek games every single week for different cup competitions. So with teams such as Liverpool, City, etc., especially those that are in Europe, we're going to start to see probably a little bit more rotation. We're going to start to see midweek games. And that will start to give us another thing to think about and another decision to make every single week. And of course, the issue with Man City is they've got enough players to rotate. We've, we call it the Pep Roulette because he traditionally rotates quite a lot. And there have also been a lot of quotes about Erling Haaland. And there are suggestions. I haven't obviously seen it myself. I don't think anyone has. But there are suggestions that in his contract, there is something to say that if he doesn't want to play and he wants to protect himself from injuries, he he has the final say on that. So I think by all accounts, we're expecting Haaland to be rotated at points this season. It's not just going to be when he's injured. We're not, they're not going to run him into the ground and then rest him. I think there's going to be some proactive resting in there. And this looks like it could be an opportunity to do so. So the quote that we got recently from Pep, this shouldn't be particularly surprising for you guys, but I know it did shock a lot of people and maybe just scare a few people potentially, is from Pep on Erling Haaland. He said, I tell you now that when we have games every three days that Erling Haaland will not play 
I will play Julian Alvarez. Now, I don't think you necessarily say that Haaland's not going to play at all and that every single time they have sort of midweek games, he's going to rotate Haaland every time. I think what he was suggesting here in the context was people were asking about Alvarez and whether he'll make his way into the team. And I think he was suggesting that, yes, the reason he's been brought in is because Haaland can't play every game and also Alvarez can play various positions. Now, this might make Alvarez a cheap option at some point, but I think more realistically what this suggests is that when there are sort of three games in eight or nine days for Man City... It's unlikely that Harlan will start all three or potentially, I guess he could start all three and just get a very early sub in each. But what you're potentially looking at, therefore, is he's not going to play sort of 90 minutes in every game. So the three games coming up, I've tried to give you a bit of a timeline here to sort of explain exactly how it's going to happen. So game week four, 27th of August, it's Crystal Palace at home. There's then the three days, if you don't include the Palace game or the Forest game, there's three days in between Par Palace and Forest. So I think that's actually a reasonable sort of period of time. To, to recover three full days and then obviously you've got the day that they play Palace and the day that they play Forest so potentially like adding up maybe like three and a half four days worth so I don't think that one's too bad the issue is then two days after Forest they then play Aston Villa away on the 3rd of September so I would be very very shocked personally if Haaland starts all three of these I, d I don't think with the quotes that we've seen with the stuff that we've heard about Haaland's contract it makes no sense here especially when the Forest game in particular and this isn't beating down on Forest or saying that Forest aren't a good team, but you would expect City to be able to win that game without Erling Haaland. I wouldn't be surprised to see Haaland start Palace, rested against Forest, play against Villa. But the thing is, he is so, so fantastic. His underlying data last season and even at the start of this season has been exceptional. He's getting chances. If Haaland gets 70, 80 against Palace, 20 or 10 against Forest, and then maybe like 70 or 80 against Villa... I still think he might be worth keeping. The issue that we've got is we really did want to captain him in game week five against Forest. It's a nice fixture, but we always knew that was a midweek fixture. And I think even us Haaland owners knew that we probably wouldn't be willing to captain him unless something changed, unless they had like loads of injuries or unless we got some different quotes which suggested that Haaland was going to play these games. But with the quotes, with everything that we've heard, I would not be surprised. And I personally believe that Haaland will not start all three of these. The question then comes... Is it worth selling Haaland? And if so, who for? Because if you're going to get, say, let's say 70 and 70 in four and six, and then like 30 minutes or 20 minutes in game week five, let's just say it's a rough estimate. It could be a different sort of distribution of minutes. Then you may be getting like roughly 150, 160 minutes from Haaland across these three. Could be potentially pushing up to 200, could be as low as about 120, 130, I suppose. But realistically, I reckon about 150 minutes. If you can get Harry Kane for 270 minutes, do you think Harry Kane will outscore Haaland for 270 minutes versus Haaland for approximately 150 minutes? Maybe, potentially. And if you bring Kane in, are you potentially looking to captain Kane across any of the next three weeks? He's got some very decent fixtures. Probably unlikely to captain him in game week four because you've got Salah against Bournemouth, but you could captain him against West Ham in game week five, I believe, and then Fulham in six. So there are things to think about. And then the other consideration is, do you just bin off the premium strikers altogether? I've seen a few people talking about maybe just going for one premium, having Salah as that one premium, that permanent captain for most weeks. And then outside of that, if you did like Haaland to Tony, that would give you a lot of money to play within your squad, like basically over over four million, right? Four and a half million to then sort of distribute around. You can maybe take a bit of money out your defense as well. You might be able to bring in the likes of sort of Madison, Rodrigo, really flesh out that, that midfield and maybe go for three strikers as well. So I think there's justification to sell Haaland. I don't think I'm going to sell him before Palace because they've still had a full week before Palace. I think I, I'm almost certain, in my opinion, he's going to play against Palace. And if he does play against Palace, I, I would argue he's just as good of an option as Harry Kane because his data is significantly better than Kane's at the start of the season. I haven't seen enough from Kane personally to want to make that switch. And I also, I still like the flexibility of a two premium draft rather than switching to one premium and doing like a Haaland to a Tony. So for me, game week four, Probably not. I do understand that you might be getting ahead of the curve because we might be looking to do Haaland to Kane next week anyway if we think he's going to be rotated against Forest. I'm happy giving Haaland one more week though because yes, Palace are a decent team and yes, City have struggled against Palace in the past. But I still think Haaland is the better asset. I, I genuinely think if you're doing Haaland to Kane, I, I think that's a downgrade. I don't think that's a sideways move. I don't think that's attacking the fixtures. I think that is a straight up downgrade. I think Haaland is the better asset at the moment. So for me, I'm looking at keeping Haaland for Palace then we'll see. If he only gets 60 minutes and he looks really fresh, maybe we just roll the dice and take a risk. If he plays 90 minutes, gets run into the ground, maybe doesn't look that great, and Alvarez doesn't get many minutes, for example, maybe we say, look, it looks very obvious he's going to be rotated in five. Villa's not the easiest fixture. I'm not saying it's a, um, I'm not saying it's a difficult fixture, but it's not the easiest fixture. Maybe in game week five, we say, do you know what, over the next two, I think it's West Ham and Fulham for Spurs. That's when we make the switch. So my opinion is currently I'm going to give him one more week at least. 
and then reassessing game week five. But there is justification. I actually think I would be tempted if I were to make the move now to just go to Tony and really invest in the midfield. Because I think there are a lot of midfield options emerging at the moment. Like I said, Madison and Rodrigo too at the moment, which a lot of people don't have, but look really good. So I think you could definitely invest some more money into the midfield, maybe go to one premium draft. And if that really fails... I guess you can wildcard out of it because we have that wildcard in the back pocket. So let me know down below. Are you considering selling Haaland? Are you worried about Man City rotation? I guess it's quickly worth mentioning just that players outside of that sort of Walker, Cancelo, I think a lot of their players will be rotated. But generally speaking, I don't think that would be a reason to sell them for me. I think Cancelo should play pretty much every minute. There's a small chance Walker sits out one of these three, but I would not be surprised to see him start all of them. And with the centre-backs, they've just not got enough options at the moment to rotate. So I think generally speaking, most people will own sort of Edison, one of the defenders, and then Haaland. And to be honest, I think you're fine for game week four. And maybe we readdress this in game week five. But like I said, let me know down below what your current plan is with Haaland. So the next question is another big discussion point, and it is the Leeds midfielders, because listen, the fixtures from game week four and beyond, specifically from game week five and beyond, they do look absolutely fantastic. And as I've said in the previous game week preview video, if you're looking at wildcarding in game week nine, the fixtures from game week five to game week eight, so Everton, Brentford, Forest, and Manchester United on the Fantasy Football Hub fixture ticker actually place Leeds at the top from an attacking perspective. So by all accounts, bringing in a Leeds attacker from game week five to game week eight, if you are planning a game week nine wildcard, which we will discuss later in the video as well, when to wildcard, it looks like a fantastic option. And I don't think, yes, Brighton are a, a, a good defense and I do expect them to maybe contain Leeds a little bit. I don't think there's necessarily an issue with moving this week if you want to. The issue we've got is that Rodrigo, at the time of recording, this has moved up to 6.3. Looks like he could even get up to 6.4 at points uh, at some point this week. So you've got Rodrigo who's risen in price. The question is, is he worth an extra 8, 0.8 million on top of Aronson plus an extra 0.3 on top of Harrison. And for some people, they just can't get to Rodrigo. It's not necessarily that they don't think Rodrigo's worth it. It's just maybe you've got like a Neto or a Bailey and you've only got a bit of money in the bank and you can't get to Rodrigo without either taking a hit or changing the structure in your team. So maybe you're just thinking, are Aronson and Harrison potentially good alternatives? So I'm going to try and answer that question. But like I said, the fixtures are great. Whether you're planning to wildcard sort of immediately into a game week five or six, I still think the next couple are good. If you're planning like most people a wildcard around sort of game week eight, game week nine, I think the fixtures are great. And even if you're planning a slightly later wildcard, which again, we'll discuss later around sort of game week 12, 13. I still don't mind the fixtures for Leeds. So I think by all accounts, regardless of whatever your strategy is, I think a Leeds midfielder is definitely worth bringing in. There are only sort of three options in my opinion, Harrison, Aronson and Rodrigo. Aronson being the cheapest, Harrison's sort of that mid price and Rodrigo is the one that's risen in price already three times. If they have gone up in price, at the time you're watching this, I do apologize. But at the time of recording, these are the correct prices. So what I've got is I've got minutes per game. I've got projected points from game week four to game week eight, which again is when most people are looking at wildcarding in game week nine. Then I've got non-penalty expected goals per 90 and expected assist per 90. All of these statistics are from the Fantasy Football Hub website. Like I said, I am partnered with Fantasy Football Hub for this season for as little as £2.10 per month. If you use the link in the description, get 30% off for as little as £2.10 per month. Get access to pretty much every feature on their site. It's absolutely fantastic. We'll be using it all season and long definitely worth looking at as little as two pound ten a month so use the link in the description if you do want to get access to the opt to statistics that we use in these videos so minutes per game just over the first three again it's quite a small sample size still but aronson looks the most nailed at 86 minutes but harrison's very close behind at 85 minutes so if you're looking for the most nailed on two and i think this goes not only short term but long term as well aronson and harrison in my opinion are the two most nailed rodrigo for now as far as i'm concerned is still very nailed and even when bamford is back I still think with the way that Jesse Marsh speaks about Rodrigo, I still think I'm, I'm pretty convinced that Rodrigo is, is now from now on, unless we see a real deterioration in his performances. So by all accounts, I would be very shocked if over, even with the rotation we're going to get due to midweek, I'd be shocked if all three don't start the next sort of three or four fixtures. I could be wrong. Leeds fans, let me know down below if you think that is wrong. I would say if you're going literally just for the most nailed, in my opinion, the irreplaceable one in that team is Aronson. So if you're looking purely for expected minutes, I would say Aronson, but I think all of them are fairly nailed. Projected points over the next, up until so when we're planning on wildcarding around game week nine, I am. Aronson's actually come out on top at 19.9, which when we look at the other stats is actually really surprising to me, but I'd be interested to look at the specifics of the hub algorithm for this one. Maybe it is the expected minutes that come in, coming into play when we look at sort of the midweek fixture coming up. Harrison shortly behind at 19.1 and actually Rodrigo is in third. Now, these algorithms, because they're not very knee jerky like humans, they sometimes take a couple of weeks to catch up. So maybe it's just a matter of it lagging slightly behind and wanting to see a little bit more information. 
The most important for me though, if we're looking at this and I'm trying to give you my objective opinion is of course the expected data. So expected data gives us a bit of an idea about how many goals they were expected to get from the positionings they were in and the, the conversion, etc. And then expected assist is the expected creativity that they were. So how many assists were they expected to get across the first three? And we've got these per 90. So Aronson is 0.24 expected goals per 90 and 0.1 expected assist per 90. So putting that together, his expected goal involvement is 0.34. I'm really shocked because that's pretty low, especially when you consider he had a, a, a very big chance in game week three against Chelsea. If you remove that, it's actually about 0.2. So very, very interesting because he passes the eye test and he looks fantastic. I do wonder with Aronson, similar to what you see from like an Eze, is Aronson a fantastic player? Yes. Is he going to get a lot of minutes? Yes. Does he always look good when you watch him? Yes. Is he going to get you loads of attacking FPL returns? Maybe not. And that is something to monitor. Maybe I could be wrong. I do think he's an excellent player. But I, when I look at the underlying statistics, at least from the first three games, I'm not seeing anything there. Only 0.34 expected goal involvement to suggest to me that he's going to get you tons of attacking returns. But something to monitor because they, they haven't had the easiest opening three fixtures lead. So something maybe to monitor from game week four and beyond when the fixtures get a little bit easier. Maybe Aronson starts to accumulate more chances and create more big chances as well. The other two incredibly impressive underlying data. So as you can see here, Harrison has 0.59 expected assists per 90 and 0.24 expected goals. So similar goal threat to Aronson, but a much higher expected assist. And Harrison has actually created the combined most big chances in the league along with Kevin De Bruyne this season. So if you're looking for creativity, Harrison is at the top of the list in the Premier League this season. He looks really, really good. And when you couple that with a decent 0.24 expected goals, putting that together, he's showing outrageously good data from the first three fixtures. And again, along with Aronson, definitely passing the eye test. I'll be honest, I'm super, super, super tempted to move for Harrison this week. Of the three, it's a bit of like my gut feeling that Harrison could be the one to own. I really like the look of him. I love seeing that much creativity, decent expected goals as well. And the fact that you are saving 0.3 on Rodrigo and potentially looking at someone else that might kick on if we're expecting Rodrigo to regress slightly. I do really like Harrison as an option. He's putting up some seriously good data, but, all of that being said, you really can't ignore the data that we're seeing from Re Rodrigo at the moment and the eye test, everything. He just looks absolutely exceptional. Been given the captain's armband. Jesse Marsh is going on about him nonstop in all of the interviews and rightly so. He's been exceptional. As you can see here, non-penalty expected goals of 0.68 and expected assist of 0.5, almost as creative as Harrison and then blows the other two out the water for expected goals. So by all accounts, the data suggests Rodrigo is the one to own. The eye test potentially suggests he's the one to own. And if you can afford him, he's probably the one to move for. But like I said, I like to look for opportunities to break away if I think it's a close call. And I think I see something that maybe others haven't seen as much. And from the games that I, I've watched, all three of the games, from the games I've watched and from having a look at this data and looking at last season as well, I think Harrison could be a decent option as well. The one here that stands out as so far not being great from a statistical perspective is Aronson. But I'll be completely honest. If you told me you were bringing in any of these three now, I absolutely love it. The only thing I would say is, like I said, I think over the next 10 game weeks, their most difficult fixture is arguably game week four, Brighton away. I know it's down as green here on the FDR, but for me, this isn't an easy fixture at all. And I think Brighton could restrict them to zero, one or maybe two goals. So by all means, Aronson, Harrison and Rodrigo could be the ones involved in that goal or two, and they could still get you like 10 to 12 points potentially. But I wouldn't be rushing to get them for game week four. I think game week five and beyond, absolutely. I think you don't need a Leeds attacker, but I would say it's definitely worth having one. You could even go on the Leeds midfield double up, which I've seen a few people talk about. Having like a Harrison and a Rodrigo, I wouldn't mind that at all. So if I were to put them in order, it would be an order of price, unfortunately. It would be Rodrigo, Harrison, Aronson. I've just got a bit of a feeling about Harrison though. Let me know down below if you like any of these three. If you've already got any of them in your team, are any of you looking at a double up or are you maybe looking to move from game week five? Like I said, when they then have Everton, Brentford, Nottingham Forest, Man United, look like that could be a really nice fixture run. So the next question was around Bakayo Saka and Mason Mount. Both dropped down to 7.9 million at the time of recording. Is it worth selling Mason Mount and Bakayo Saka? If so, do you sell them now? Do you wait a couple of fixtures? Because by all accounts, the next two fixtures for Arsenal and Chelsea are both pretty decent. I mean, Arsenal in particular got Fulham at home and Villa at home. Two home fixtures, two defences who can concede, look to be fairly attacking at the moment. Mason Mount having Leicester at home. Leicester really don't look great at the moment. Southampton away, a good fixture. Also having Fulham in game week seven. 
And so the issue you've got with these two is they're, they're exceptionally good players, Saka and Mount. I don't think anyone would deny that. And they've got good fixtures coming up. And I guess you've got that almost like investment element. Like I've bought them. I've kept them maybe two. If you've had them the whole season, you've had them for three game weeks. You almost feel like, as soon as you sell them, they're going to haul. It's that worry that I've held them for three weeks. We've not got much from them at all. I'm going to sell them. And then Bukayo Saka is going to score a brace against Fulham. Now, I don't think that's a reason to hold on to a player. There's a bit of psychology in that, but we won't delve into that today. But I do think you need to just look at them, look at their underlying data, look at the performances and decide, are they an asset you want in your team? Like I said, I don't think you should be focusing on they're, they're going to score when when I can, when as soon as I sell them, they're going to start scoring. They're going to start getting into form. And I'm going to wish I didn't sell them. That's basically gambler's fallacy, right? That they're due, a, they're due a return. As soon as you sell them, they're going to be due a return, right? So I think look at them on their merit. Look at their underlying data. Look at what you have seen with your eyes, however you decide your decisions and then commit to it. And listen, you could quite easily sell Saka and he could get a brace. You could sell Mount. He could get a brace against Leeds. These are two good fixtures. But as we'll see in a second, the data doesn't suggest that these two are worth keeping. So minutes per game so far over the first three, you can see Bakayo Saka's getting 87 minutes. So he's still very, very nailed. I would be surprised if he's benched anytime soon. He still looks like a key cog in that sort of Arsenal attack. Mason Mount getting slightly less minutes. He's getting 77 minutes on average. He's a slight rotation risk, I guess, Mason Mount. But again, I still expect him to start the majority of games. Of course, game week five being a midweek fixture does throw. It's not only with Manchester City that that mixes things up. Could also be for Arsenal and also for Chelsea. Something to monitor maybe but I do expect both of these to start most of the games available to them you can see FPL points so far because Saka is 3.67 per 90 Mason Mount 2.33 so very disappointing output and to be honest their expected FPL points aren't much higher you can see 3.98 for Saka 3.84 for Mount so Mount in particular is underperforming a little bit more than Saka but neither of them is showing great expected FPL points either and that also goes for their expected goal involvement so expected goals and expected assists combined Saka's only at 0.31 and Mason Mount is even lower at 0.27. So not only is there really poor output from Saka and Mason Mount, their expected data is really poor as well. And their expected data would suggest that they're not looking like they're going to get a lot of chances either. So by all accounts, this would suggest to me that they are good assets to sell. I, I wouldn't necessarily hold on to them. Yes, they are at fantastic assets at points in the past. We've seen that. Yes, the fixtures are good, but this data does not look good at all for either of them. Even things such as like shots, Bakayo Saka's only getting 1.67 shots per 90. That is significantly lower than what we last saw last season. Mason Mount is getting 2.33, which is better than Saka, but still not particularly great. And this is where I was really shocked about Bakayo Saka. And this for me would be the reason that I would be most willing to sell him. He's only getting four touches in the box per 90. Now that might sound like a lot to you, but last season at points, he was getting eight or nine touches in the box per 90. He's one of the highest in the Premier League usually for touches in the box per 90. So... He's almost not even getting involved as much. And if you actually look at his touch map, courtesy of Fantasy Football Hub, like I said, do check out the link in the description. It's a little bit deeper than usual. He always has had that almost like Salah touch map where he's out wide quite a bit. There's a lot of touches a little bit deeper and there's nowhere near as many in that sort of central in the box role. So he's staying very wide and very right. I do wonder whether Tommy Asu coming back at some point will make Saka a better option because I think at the moment what we're seeing is Martinelli and Zinchenko are creating a lot down that left side and a lot of their attacks are focused on the left-hand side. So Saka's almost playing a slightly more like reserved role on that sort of right side, but it doesn't look particularly promising there. Mason Mount slightly more touches in the box at 5.67 per 90, but by all accounts, if I'm doing my job as a content creator, these do not look like two assets that are worth owning. But I always hesitate because even though I've just said don't do this, these do feel like two decent fixtures for Bakayo Saka and Mason Mount. So I guess what my opinion would be on this, if you've got two free transfers and you think selling Saka or Mount to a cheap like a Rodrigo or a Harrison will give you money in the bank that you can immediately use to better your team in game week four, I would sell both of them. I would be happy selling both of them. If you're selling them for someone that you don't really think is a great option this week and you're not going to use that money in the bank this week, I would potentially look to keep both of them, maybe like roll a transfer forward to next week and then deal with it next week. So I think Villa and Southampton, if again, they don't perform against Fulham and Le Leicester, I think after four fixtures of underperformance, you've got to just say, you know what, we're just going to get rid of them. So my opinion would be, unless you see a really good downgrade that you're happy with, like a Rodrigo, like Harrison, whoever it may be, and then you can also use that money to upgrade immediately, then I would do it. Otherwise, I'm not sure. The final thing to note is just, if you don't have Martinelli, I would sell both for Martinelli. I suppose there's a slight worry that Martinelli he might be rotated in game week five, but I just think he's such a good asset. He's going to continue to rise in price, in my opinion. If you don't have Martinelli, I would happily sell either of these to Martinelli. Outside of that, Rodrigo looks like the better option. But like I said, Brighton in game week four, 
I think you could potentially go for Rodrigo from game week five, Everton, Brentford, etc. So that's my opinion on it. Let me know down below if you own Saka or Mason Mount, what are you looking to do with them? It's always a tricky one when you own a good asset and they've got decent fixtures because you never want to sell them. But this data does not look promising at all. So there were quite a few questions around when the best time to wildcard is. And I assume that's because a lot of people are considering either playing the wildcard this week or potentially looking to play it very soon and wondering if they're going to lose out or if there's a more optimal time to play it later on before, obviously, we get the unlimited transfers in game week 17 for the World Cup. So... Listen, this, this advice that I'm going to give is very generic. And with wild cards and chip strategies in general, and even transfers to some extent, it's massively team dependent. So what I would say is if your team right now doesn't look in a great way, and you look at it and think, if I were to wild card, I'd make maybe five or six changes. I'd restructure the team slightly. And I think that will massively benefit my team moving forward. I would absolutely encourage you to play the wild card. I think due to the fact that we get unlimited transfers in game week 17, due to the fact that there are a couple of fixture swings coming up, you can jump on the likes of Leeds. You can maybe get an Ivan Tony into your team. I do think this is a decent time to wild card, and I definitely wouldn't suggest that you shouldn't do it if you feel like your team needs it. But I look at my own team and I look at a lot of the teams around me. And unless you are sort of knee jerking and overreacting to game week three, which didn't go well for a lot of us, our teams should be set up with really nice fixtures moving forward and in a really good place. So for most of us, I don't think we need a wild card now. If that is the case, and you're happy holding it a little bit longer. Here are my top three times and places that I would be looking to play the wild card in my personal opinion. Of course, number one gold, number one is game week nine wild card. I've spoken about this for a while. Between game week eight and game week nine, there is a two week international break. And as a result, I think there's obviously you can respond to any injuries that might happen in the international break. You can potentially catch quite a few price rises as well. And more importantly, not just because it's an international break, there's a pretty big fixture swing around game week nine as well. Now, not all of these teams are specifically in game week nine, but they're all around this time. So Brighton, Brentford, Arsenal and Spurs all start to have pretty tricky fixtures from game week nine right up until the unlimited transfers in game week 17, but specifically up until about sort of game week 13, 14. So you could potentially look to offload the Brighton and Brentford players and maybe just thin out the amount of Arsenal players you have because they still look like a brilliant team. If they're still playing well, then you're not going to want to just remove all of your Arsenal players. Maybe you don't have a triple up. Maybe you go to a single or a double. And then Leicester, Palace, West Ham and Bournemouth all look like they've got really nice fixtures from game week nine and beyond. So if Leicester can improve, we might jump on the likes of Madison and Vardy. Palace, we might be looking at to invest in their defence, like an Anderson and Mitchell, Mark Gehi. There's a lot of nice options there. If West Ham start to improve, we might be looking at a Bowen. We might be looking at a Skamaka or an Antonio. There's potential options there. And even from the likes of Bournemouth and Fulham, they've got decent fixtures too. So by all accounts, due to the fixture swing, international break, etc., and also due to it being about midway between game week one and the international... Um, and the World Cup when we get the unlimited transfers. I think game week nine just presents a really nice opportunity in my opinion. The other option that you've got, which is slightly sooner, unless you're literally playing it now or next week, is game week seven. The reason I like game week seven is, again, there's a bit of a fixture swing for a few teams. Wolves, Spurs, Brighton, and Chelsea. So if you've got maybe like a couple from Brighton, maybe you've got like a Kane and maybe a Mason Mount or a James and maybe like a Neto. Maybe if your team's fleshed out with quite a few from those teams, you might potentially look to play it because West Ham, Newcastle, Forest, and Villa, four teams who I expect to do fairly well this year, by the way. I don't expect any of those teams to go down. Newcastle in particular look great if you can jump on those teams and maybe remove those players from sort of Wolves and Brighton that could be a decent time too but you would have to consider trying to pick a few players from the likes of Palace and Leicester as well because if you're wildcarding in sort of between game week five and game week seven you need to think about how far behind the curve you're going to be when those of us like myself wildcarding game week nine so you do need to think ahead a little bit as well and then if you don't if you're not looking to wildcard in seven and maybe you look at your team around game week nine and you think I can get away with just using transfers I do think there's an opportunity to play it slightly later now if you do that I think what you're potentially looking at is about a game week 13 wildcard. So the way that this would work is, like I said, the likes of Arsenal and Spurs, etc., have pretty tricky fixtures from about game week eight, game week nine to game week 13-ish. So you could, using your transfers, start to thin out those Arsenal players, maybe switch your Spurs players out for some other options. Maybe, like I said, get rid of those players from sort of Brighton, Brentford, etc., that you might have done on a wildcard just with your free transfers. And then what you can do is wildcard those teams back in because you're probably going to want to own those assets long term, specifically Arsenal and Spurs. The issue you've got with a game week nine wildcard is if you wildcard those players out, you've then got to use free transfers to bring them back in. So I guess it's two different ways of doing exactly the same thing with the same players. It's just when you plan on playing your wildcard. So there's the option there to do that. I just think maybe you're not getting as much value from your wildcard if you're playing it sort of very close to your unlimited transfers. So for me, 
it's just the clear option is game week nine wildcard at the moment. The fixtures swing the international break. All of it just looks like a really good option for me. I don't mind playing it now. Like I said, if you jump on Leeds, potentially Brighton and Brentford, making sure you've got that Arsenal triple up, maybe looking to limit yourself on City players with the upcoming rotation that we're expecting. I don't mind any of that. But for me, game week nine probably looks like the best option. So as we always do in these videos, just finishing off with some other questions asked, a little bit more quick fire, just my personal opinion on them. Like I've said for a while though, three game weeks still probably isn't enough data. It's still a fairly small sample size. So this is just an opinion. Feel free to disagree with me down in the comments down below. And as I always say, follow me over on Twitter because I get these questions from you over on Twitter every single week. I ask for your questions, dilemmas, discussion points for the game week preview video. So if you want to get your questions answered, as well as becoming a member or a patron, which will circle around here where you get priority questions, of course, do follow me over on Twitter at FPL double underscore Raptor. So the first question is, is Big at the back dead? Is it time to move money into the attack? It's a good question. Probably not in my personal opinion just yet, but I always, with the way I set my team up, I didn't go fully big at the back. The reason for that is always, every single season without fail, there's a lot of good attackers that emerge that we wouldn't have considered. Not many of us would have considered Rodrigo, Pascal, Gross as options. Even Ivan Tony. we knew the fixtures were okay, but not many of us considered going for a third striker. So I think by all accounts, every single year, and we'll continue to see it, there will be lots of options popping up that we wouldn't have considered. And all of a sudden, we're scrambling to take money out of our defense. So I think number one lesson here is maybe don't go fully big at the back from the start of the season, and maybe just try and invest a little bit more money into your, the attack in your team and into your midfield as well. That being said, if you've set up with a at the back team. I'm not sure I would be selling Robertson before uh, before Bournemouth. I'm not sure I'd be selling Cancelo ahead of Crystal Palace, which goes on to the second question. Would you keep Trent and Robertson double up? Yes. I would be leaving your premium defense for now. Game week three was an absolute disaster for all defenders, premium defenders in particular because of their price. But I wouldn't be too put off by that. They did fairly well in game week one and two. And you pick these defenders because consistently every season they do fairly well. You knew that that would limit you going forward in attack. So nothing really has changed particularly other than there's been a bit of an underperformance from Robertson and Trent. But I expect that to improve and to be honest Bournemouth at home is arguably the best fixture you could hope for for your double, double Liverpool defense so for me personally no I would not be selling Robertson I would still stay big at the back for now if in game week four we see a similar performance and all of the attackers still continuing to do well maybe you can either wild card and go a little bit smaller at the back or start to take some money out of the defense there question three is would you be selling willing to sell Luis Diaz I know a lot of people are looking at maybe, and I've looked at this myself in my team, I, I might be looking at it from game week five, is if you sell like Luis Diaz and Andreas or Luis Diaz and Pascal Gross in my team, you can get like a, maybe like a Rodrigo and a Zaha. Like you can maybe get like two decent options rather than just having that 8 million pound midfield spot. And to be honest, outside of Madison and Kulisevsky, the 8 million pound mids, unfortunately, have looked really poor. And I thought that was going to be such an important position in our team. But Foden, Mares, Saka, even Diaz to some extent, have... Uh, uh, I've really struggled to be honest. So maybe, maybe I would consider selling Luis Diaz, but again, similar to Robbo, not before Bournemouth at home. This is not the fix to be selling him, but maybe from game week five, like I said, selling a Diaz and selling a Gross might be able to get me something like a Zaha and a Rodrigo. And maybe in combination that is better. And maybe you just ditch the 8 million pound midfield spot. Question four is, can we switch to a one premium draft? Is it time to sell the premium strikers? We discussed this briefly in sort of the selling Haaland section at the start. I do think it is feasible only if you've still got the wild card. If you've already used a wild card, I wouldn't be doing this because then there's no way to get out of that apart from using like two or three transfers to then restructure the team again. But if you've got the wild card in the back pocket, by all means, do Haaland down to, or Kane down to Tony or Haaland down to Tony, spread the funds a little bit. And like I said, if all of a sudden that goes wrong and De Bruyne, Son, Kane and Haaland all really smash it over the next few, you can wild card out of that. I still personally prefer the two premium formations and the two premium structures. So I probably won't be doing this. It is definitely tempting, though, when you consider you can do Kane to Tony. We expect to do, Tony to do fairly well. We'll probably captain Salah most weeks anyway. And those funds could be really useful to allow us to get in some of those midfielders that are starting to look really good. So I don't mind it. I would just be skeptical if you've already used the wild card about doing that. And then the fifth question is something I still don't know the answer to is if you don't own Perisic already, would you look to buy him? Like I said, by all accounts, in my opinion, Perisic is arguably the best asset in the game when we're looking at value. If he starts games, if he starts and gets 60 minutes at least in these games, I think he's arguably the most underpriced asset in the game and he will be absolutely fantastic value and he should be 100% owned. The issue is he's not going to start every game. And even in the games he starts, there is the potential, as we saw with Sessing on previously, to have a sub before 60 minutes. And with the fixture congestion that they've got, I would argue there's a good chance he plays two of the next three. I think there's also a reasonable chance he only plays one of the next three. The reason I say that is he played last week. 
Sessegnon could play this week. He could then play against West Ham. Then Sessegnon could play against Fulham. So there's a good chance that in the next three fixtures, Perisic only plays one. There's also a good chance that he plays all three. I genuinely do not know, but I would worry just due to his injuries, due to his fitness, that he's probably not going to get all three. If he gets a one pointer in the one that he doesn't, maybe has the opportunity for an early sub in one. Even if he gets a 15 pointer in one of them, you'll get fairly close with someone that's just getting one or two clean sheets. And that's assuming that he gets a 15 pointer. So I think you are relying with Perisic on every time he starts and gets 60, you're going to need at least bonus points and an attacking return because he's not going to play every game and he's going to get a quite a few string of one pointers. So maybe I'm slightly biased because I don't own him. Maybe I'm trying to convince myself not to buy him. If you already own him, I'm very jealous of you. I think he's, he's a fantastic asset. I would definitely be starting him if I owned him. But I'm just looking at someone in my team like a Trippier. Is it worth selling Trippier who's playing against Wolves? Trippier is definitely nailed on, definitely on set pieces. Is it worth selling Trippier for Perisic when we don't even know that Perisic is going to start? I think if we get confirmation that Perisic is starting game week four against Forest. I will find it very tricky to not move for him. But at the moment, I would potentially say don't buy, don't sell, unless you're looking to take a risk. I know a lot of people think it's worth the risk. If he plays, like I said, he's going to be an absolutely fantastic value asset. So guys, there you have it. That is my Game Week 4 preview video. I feel like we're throwing it back slightly. This is a slightly longer video. I've shortened the video slightly this season, and this feels like a slightly longer video than usual. So if you do enjoy the longer content, make sure to drop a like on this video. And if you're still watching this right now, listening to me, let me know down below you're someone that watches the entire video, because I really appreciate those of you that stick through watching the entire videos it helps the youtube algorithm and it also makes all of the effort worth it as well so let me know down below if you are someone that watches all of the videos and every minute of them too thank you very much for watching if you are and if for some reason you're not yet subscribed we are very close to 25,000 subscribers so i'd massively appreciate if whilst you drop a like and drop a comment also if you could subscribe i would massively appreciate that until next time guys thank you very much for watching cheers Bye bye